Element Lines number 35029, a 462 tender engine, had an average life working on the Southern Railway. It was originally built with air smooth casing until 1959 when she was rebuilt into a more standard form that we all recognise today. Like her sisters, Element Lines was named after shipping companies and just like her sisters, upon her withdrawal in 1966, she was sent to Barry Scrapyard in Wales with an unknown fate. It was 10 years later that her fate was decided and the National Railway Museum purchased her but wanted to make some modifications. Some serious modifications. So why cut up a perfectly good engine? The National Railway Museum wanted an engine with a specific purpose to teach others about how a steam engine works. What better way than to use a full-size example? So let's have a unique look under the hood and let's see what makes this girl tick. We start at the firebox. The firebox is the very heart of the engine. It's its life source. To understand how a firebox works, we need to understand how the fire works as well. Fire needs three elements, fuel, heat and oxygen. It must have all three to burn and too much of one element will cause the fire to fail. The floor of the firebox isn't solid and allows for air to pass through. The fireman controls the air through the dampness located in the cab. If the fireman uses too much coal, then the dampness can't work effectively and the fire will fail, while too much air and not enough coal will cause the heat to decrease. It's a fine art to keep everything in balance. For the next step, we need to look at the coal itself. Coal is made up of 60% carbon, 20% gas and 20% of incombustible materials. The fire burns the carbon which releases the gas, the heat and the incombustible materials. The incombustible materials remain in the firebox as ash and clinker, while the gases rise and with the force of the air are drawn into the boiler. If the firebox was the heart of the engine, then the boiler is the engine's arteries and veins. Lengths of tubes are connected from the firebox to the smoke box. The gases released from the burning coal travel along these pipes, warming the water that surround them. It was well known early on, even as far back as the Rainhill trials, that the more surface area you have, the more efficient the engine. Long and numerous pipes gave more surface area for the water to boil to create steam. The job done, the coal gases are then sent along to the smoke box to be chuffed out the chimney. The firebox, which was also surrounded by water, helped in its own part to get the water bubbling and ready for the next stage. With the steam collecting at the top of the boiler, the boiler pressure increases and is strictly monitored. All running steam locomotives are fitted with a safety valve. If the pressure in the boiler is more than its capacity, the safety valve opens to let out the steam. It's better the safety valve than the boiler deciding it will release the pressure itself, usually in explosive circumstances. Likewise, if the water in the boiler gets too low, the top of the firebox or top sheet would overheat. As it was the hottest part of the engine, it is vital to re it must remain under the water line to protect itself and dissipate the heat it creates. Horrible accidents have occurred when the top sheet ruptured, allowing pressurized boiling steam into the cab. To prevent this, a temperature plug was created. If the top sheet got too hot, the plug dropped and steam was vented directly back into the firebox. Not only was this a life-saving device, but it was an embarrassing and costly one for the crew. Dropping the plug meant a garnish from the wages, an ear bashing from the boss, and a fair bit of mocking from the workmates. The steam in the boiler is building nicely, but it's not ready for the engine yet. It collects at the top of the boiler in the steam dome. The dome contains the throttle, which is attached to the regulator within the cab. The driver moves the regulator, which opens the throttle and allows the collected steam to travel down the steam pipe. In many high-speed locomotives like Element Lines, the steam is carrying too much water and is too under-pressured, so it travels to a superheader heater located in the smoke box. This forces the steam back within the boiler. 
The gases that heat the water now heat the steam, drying it and giving it much more energy. The steam travels back to the smoke box and is forced down to the steam chest located on either side of the chassis. The steam chests are the muscles of the engine. They contain a sliding valve that direct the steam into each end of the cylinder. The valve injects the steam into the cylinder at each end alternatively, causing the piston to slide backwards and forwards, while at the same time causing spent steam to escape away through the pipes and back into the smoke box. As the piston is being moved backward and forward, the motion travels down the connecting and coupling rods and finally to the driving wheels, causing them to turn. The steam isn't just used for the engine, other parts of the locomotive need steam to run as well. The water injector supplying water from the tender to the boiler was steam driven, as well as the whistle and the air compressor for the braking system. Once the steam had done its job, it needed to be expelled. And now we look at the lungs of the engine, its blast pipe. A blast pipe nestled within the smoke box had two main functions to expel the steam and gases and to draw the gases from the firebox into the boiler. A blast of air would force the steam and the gases upwards and out of the chimney, creating the chuffing sounds all railway enthusiasts have grown to love. In the meantime, it created a vacuum in the boiler pipes and which the hot gases from the firebox would fill. Out of all of the components, the blast pipe was the was an engineer's nightmare. The blast from the blast pipe had to be specifically timed to the cylinders. Too much chuffing and solid particles can be drawn from the firebox and would block boiler tubes. Too little a so and it would cause a soft exhaust and an underperforming engine. Many argued how to get the blast pipe right, and I can imagine there were several disagreements. Most steam engines tend to share all of the above traits, but other functions and parts can vary from engine to engine, and even country to country. As long as the basics were applied, then you can easily adapt the rest to suit the need, and as long as the engine received regular maintenance, the engines would run for years, with some engines soon to celebrate a hundred years on the line. So let's go back to Ellerman Lines. She's a merchant navy class bullied, built in Eastleigh in 1949, and has several unique features to her class. She was one of 30 engines and was considered one of the most powerful and largest engines to grace the railway, certainly from the southern region. In 1959, her air smooth casing was removed as it was deemed much more of a hindrance than a benefit. But time soon caught up with the engine, and just seven years after her overhaul, Ellerman lines were withdrawn and sent to Wales and the infamous Barry Scrapyard. When the National Railway Museum was founded, their main goal was to preserve and educate. Digital diagrams were unheard of and the museum wanted to make a statement and have a full-size 3D diagram of an engine's inner workings. After careful examination of the engines in the scrapyards, the museum decided that Ellerman Lines would fit this need and she was purchased. Ellerman Lines was taken to Suesden in 1974 where she was carefully sectioned before she was taken to York to become one of the museum's many exhibits. There was much controversy about cutting up a historical artefact in this way, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. And I think if the museum had the resources of today, maybe Ellerman Lines would have been preserved intact. So even though Ellerman Lines can never run again, we are lucky that 11 of her sisters were also bought and preserved, with some still in steam on the main line today. So even though Ellerman Lines is not doing the job she intended, she is still providing a valued service as the largest 3D diagram of a steam engine's inner workings, certainly in the UK, maybe even the world. <laughs>